Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of the History Hour. My name is Mr. Kent. I am a substitute high school teacher. While I cover all subjects, my main focus in school was history. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Professor White. I am a professor of Western Civilization as well as other points of history at Lincoln Land College in Springfield, Illinois. A little bit of behind-the-scenes movie magic, as it were. If you continue this episode, you may discover that the audio quality is a little bit better here than it is in the rest. We're recording this the next week, and we realized that we didn't do the best job in episode one. We're going to try to do a better job going forward. Thing is, we aren't experts. If you like it, though, please hang with us. We think it'll be worth your time, and we'll try to do our best. What may separate us and authors you're familiar with, or even other podcasters, is that unlike them, we're not what you would consider professional full-time stories. We don't have any published works. We don't have any accreditations or whatnot. For a number of years, I have found the topic intensely interesting. I'd like to share some of what I know with all of you. Absolutely. It's a fascinating subject. You can learn a lot about, well, humanity, culture, so much. And it really is sad how little people really know about the subject. It's a little disappointing, really. Throughout my years, I've read a handful of things. I've watched documentaries, various podcasts, things like that. Went through a whole bunch of lectures um, in high school and college. It's given me what I believe to be a fairly large and expansive look at history. I have a handful of areas that I feel relatively well-read and very knowledgeable in. And I just think like to share what I know with the greater audience. In my experience throughout high school and college both, but high school is what most people have experience in. Almost everyone's had to sit through a Western Civ and an American history class in the normal high school like I went through. There's not enough time for everything. At least in Western Civ, I remember by the last month or two, you know, it'd be lucky if we were at World War I. At that point, we're rushing through that. We're rushing through World War II. We're rushing through the Vietnam era and Cold War and everything else. In addition to the end being crammed, throughout the whole span of the whether it be a more specialized one in college or the generals, you miss a lot of things. And especially for those people who were never actually history majors, who never took the more in-depth specialization ones about one period or one country or one idea. The idea of this big encompassing history, so many details can become pretty daunting. And so I like the idea of us being able to address this and talk to people, explain why it is interesting, why you should care. In reality, like in my everyday life, when I talk to individuals around myself, my friends, my family members, the kids too who I substitute for, I think there is a problem with real historical illiteracy. People don't know what came before them. People don't know the history of their own country, the history of the world in general, and what it means. And it's an often repeated thing to say those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. But there is some truth in that. You see those same trends. You see the same dangerous politics and the same authoritarian or aggressive tendencies replayed again and again, people don't think to look back at what happened. They don't think to compare it to the mistakes that came before. They don't think to compare it to the failed projects and the misunderstood ideologies. If we are able to inform someone a little bit better about how things have played out, what has happened in the past, and you know, what it's really like, I think we'll be doing service, and I'll be glad if even one person feels that way once you're done. Yeah, that's some of the, my teaching philosophy pretty clearly right there, actually. So what do you say we get down to brass tacks and we have a little fun doing it? All right, let's try. So the topic for our first episode is actually one of my favorites. It's a topic we didn't talk a ton about in school. It's Mesopotamia. Literally, that means the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The things we talked about often in school, in junior high, we started with ancient Egypt. In high school, we talked about Mesopotamia very briefly, and we moved on to Egypt, and then to Greece. And Greece, and by extension Rome, given how much Rome took from Greece, is often viewed as sort of the origins of Western civilization, quote-unquote. But Greece took a lot from Mesopotamia, and Mesopotamia predates Greece by quite a significant margin. In fact, if you look at the periods we're going to talk about today, the earliest period that we talk about that has like real sort of material culture and that we have a lot of details about is the settled period, the Mesolithic, which starts roughly in 9000 BCE. We don't see a sort of urbanized walled city culture until the smaller period of 650 BCE. Now the difference between those two cultures, the cultures between a settled agrarian people to a sort of urbanized 
centralized people who hadn't yet quite developed kingship. We're kind of moving along the idea of having a real state. That's 2,500 years. Now, if we compare 2,500 years to today, if we take 2019 and we crank that back that many years, we end up in roughly 480 BCE, which is more or less the time when Xerxes actually invaded the Greek cities in the Second Persian War, which in and of itself is only 30 years after the Romans kicked out their initial king and started the beginnings of their sort of classical Roman Republic. It's only 160 years prior to the birth of Alexander the Great. That's only the early, early period. When you talk about what comes after that, you talk about the actual centralized governments of priests and kings and states and infrastructure and that sort of thing. You're looking at the Ubayat period of 5000 BCE or definitively Uruk, which starts around 3750 BCE. But Uruk doesn't end until 3150 BCE. So if you look at the year 9000 BCE, when you see sort of beginnings of cell culture, and you take it all the way to the year 3150 BC at the end of the Uruk period, you have a span of 5,850 years. If you look at the end of the Uruk period to today, to 2019, that's only 5,169 years. That means the period that we'll discuss when we talk about just the early period of Mesopotamia, only what we're talking about in the first episode, it covers a larger span of time, a more immense span of history of generations of people than the end of the early period of Mesopotamia up until the modern day, the time in which we have smartphones and the internet and cross-continental communication and space flight, the massive gulfs in time, the periods in which Mesopotamia and the regions and peripheries transition from late Stone Age and hunter-gatherer societies, from that civilized uh, kingships, right before the emergence of the first empire, the first true empire is almost 6,000 years. So when we look at this huge gulf of time and all the things they did, and we look at the fact that in 4800 BC is more or less when one of the most prominent stories of the early, you know, what we call the early Greek period, begins, the Xerxes and Persian Greek War, that's like at the end, that's thousands of years past to Rook. The Middle East is literally located centrally. It, its name is literal to the north of the Mesopotamians, or the Kurgans, and the other, or the Indo-European tribes that scattered outward. To the east, you have the Iranian plateau and the Elamites and groups like them. And further, you have the Indian subcontinent. To the south, you have the fairly centralized and fairly powerful contemporary Egyptian pharaohs and whatnot. To the west, you have the, the Hittites later, and you have the very, very early Greeks, and then later you have what would be considered the classical Greeks that we all know of. The idea of the Greeks as the ancient world would have been laughable to these people. To, to the Greeks, these people would have been antiquity. It always struck me as really interesting to talk about Mesopotamia and the origins of human civilization in the region. Is the question of why of all the places you could have settled, but there were a number of origin points where the first cities and agricultural communities developed. So why did people move into this region? If you look at it sort of from a geographic perspective, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you ask the average person today, assuming they know anything about the subject, of course, what's the geography of Iraq like? The answer you get is probably desert. And with the exception of the actual river valleys themselves, it's more or less correct. But, go back into the distant past, we're talking, you know, half a million years ago or more, it's very different. You're still coming off the Ice Age. The rivers are still there, but this is an era of marshes and forests and grassy plains. The climate is very different than it would be today. So the region seems much more inviting than it would be to a modern viewer who might see the, you know, stark contrast of green irrigated fields and barren desert. And that's the fascinating thing about it, though. Geography of Mesopotamia is so critically important to understanding how and why civilization man developed the way it did. Well, the word Mesopotamia might just mean the land between the rivers. It's so much more than that. The Tigris and Euphrates are the core of it. But if you go beyond the river valleys, you find people living all over the place. 
there are people living in the marshes at the foot of the rivers near the Persian Gulf. There are people living in the Taurus and Zagros mountains in the northern reaches. There are people, tribes mostly, living in the deserts and steppes and plateaus beyond this in Syria and Iran and Arabia and those regions. Mesopotamia, in a very real sense, isn't a geographic region so much as it is a cultural region. A group of peoples who, who shared a common culture, a common religion, later a common alphabet, and a common lifestyle. But even that isn't the whole story. To understand the history of human settlements and development of civilization in Mesopotamia, we have to go back. We have to go way back to a region of time known as the Paleolithic Age. Old Stone Age, for those of you who don't speak Greek. Now, the Old Stone Age stretches, well, more than a million years into the past, if you want to actually get fancy about it. But in terms of the earliest examples and earliest evidence of human settlements, you have to go back to about 500,000 BCE in the northern parts of the country. In modern terms, you're just north of the city of Mosul. This is on the upper Tigris River, and if we find evidence of human tool-making activities, we find evidence of camps, uh, ashes, refuse piles, bones that show clear signs of being butchered of animals. So we're still primarily talking about, you know, cave dwellings and tents and a very primitive, very nomadic kind of lifestyle. And that continues for a very, very long period of time, over 400,000 years ago. Not until about 80,000 BCE, it hit what's called the Middle Paleolithic Age. And this is the period in which we get to really see some interesting developments in human civilization. Now, there have been numerous, there's been a lot of archaeological work, numerous sites discovered over the centuries of work, even if that work has more or less ground to a halt in the modern age. But there are two finds in particular that indicate that humans are living in this region. We're talking in the upper northern parts of modern day Iraq. In large numbers. Uh, there are two caves. It's a so called Hazar Murd find, which was found in 1928 by a woman named Dorothy Gerard, and the so called Shanidar Cave find that a Dr. Selecki found in 1951. Again, these are still a very primitive set of cavemen, if you want to use that in a somewhat incorrect term. But we find plenty of evidence of stone tools. We find what's called layers of settlement. In other words, evidence that people were living there for generations upon generations, for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years in the case of Shanadar. More particularly though, and what's actually very fascinating is, most stone tools you find are made out of local materials. That makes perfect sense if you think about it. Obviously, a group of people making things for own use are going to use what they find in the region. However, in particular at Shanadar, evidence was found of tools made of obsidian. Now, for those of you not aware, obsidian is a volcanic rock, kind of glass, actually, which means that you have to be near a volcano, or at least a dormant volcano, or even an extinct volcano, to find it. However, there's not any volcanoes in Mesopotamia. In fact, looking at this geographically and geologically, the closest place this could have come from, Armenia, the Lake Van region in central Armenia, in fact, that's hundreds of thousands of miles away from these finds. This means that either these people, for whatever reason, migrated from the north and brought massive stockpiles of obsidian with them, I find that unlikely, or they were in actual contact and actually in a trade and economic relationship of some sort with early human settlements as far north as the Caucasus. That speaks to the level of habitation, interrelation, and indeed some kind of you know, economic structure which is far earlier than most would have expected it to be. More than that, in a more general sense, looking at tool styles, the kinds of knives and spears and hammers they were using, it's virtually identical to tools found in Turkey, Syria, Iran, Armenia, and beyond. Again, this speaks of a common culture, a common economic base, but at the very least, the interchange of ideas between these peoples. Although, interestingly enough, it has been noted, at least by some who have analyzed the finds, and the graves in particular, that many of the bones found in this region, human bones in particular, actually bear some distinctive Neanderthal. Now, it's widely recognized today that the Neanderthal population more or less was interbred with modern Homo sapiens, and the species more or less merged together. But this speaks of at least 
some remnants of the Neanderthal species living in Mesopotamia far later than would have been expected by earlier scientific finds. Or it could have been different remnant species, such as the Derosovans uh, from Asia. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's all kinds of human subspecies you see here. Fast forward another 70,000 years or so. You enter the period my colleague mentioned, the Mesolithic Age roughly 9,000 to 7,000 BCE here in Mesopotamia. This is a really fascinating time as it represents the first turning point toward the creation of modern settled civilization in the region. Now, on the surface, the archaeological finds aren't that different. In other words, small settlements, plenty of evidence of hunting and gathering and natural things like this. You do see a couple of different changes. One, the technology of the age is becoming far more sophisticated. We see in large numbers something called microliths. What these represent are very specialized tools. Most Paleolithic tools are very basic. Knives for butchering meat, axes for cutting down wood, spears for hunting animals or perhaps defending oneself. Couldn't say for sure. Microliths, however, represent a wide variety of specialized tools. Balls, knives, hooks, picks. Mortars, pestles, grinders, things for grinding nuts and extracting dyes and making flour, things that weren't being done in previous periods. A number of sites archaeologically that were you know, being excavated have been excavated that show Mesolithic development, but there are two that are particularly critical to talking about the transition to settled sedentary life. There's Tel Muribiet and Tepe Ali Kosh. Now at Tel Muribiet, we see two things here that are particularly interesting. One, there is strong evidence that this site was continuously occupied for most of the Mesolithic Age. So we're talking about near continuous human civilization living in this same region for nearly 2,000 years. Now, it's possible that these were still semi nomadic people. They were living here part of the year and moving other times of the year. We can't know for certain. But clearly this site was important. We also find arrowheads here, the first real evidence of a more advanced weapons technology, though. How significant you find that depends on your interest in the history of warfare, I suppose, although they're probably hunting weapons and anything else. Is there any evidence of the arrows or other weapons being used against other humans in this not period? that we find definitively. It really, there's not a lot of evidence of that. So I tend to think it probably wasn't much of that going on, if any. Well, those finds are relatively rare. We, we have found some sites of um, actual, like, caveman or what would you whatever you call early human violence in the early bronze age but those are less common than the other finds yeah, as of right now the archaeology doesn't really say one way or the other i'm people being people i'm tempted that they probably killed each other with arrows but we can't say for certain but the real thing the important thing for us though is that there's evidence that not true agriculture as we think of it but a kind of proto-agriculture is being practiced here there is this is particular because we find evidence of two types of plants, strains of wheat and barley present here. They do not grow wildly in that region, and as far as we can tell, never have. And again, the archaeology isn't foolproof here, but it's pretty definitive. This means that people brought these plants here and were cultivating them here. They couldn't have just come in by accident. Uh, also, and this is um, sort of unconnected to this, but also fascinating, is we also see evidence that tell them the yet that there was some kind of organized religious activity happening. Because underground, we actually find that people were excavating the underground chambers and building what very much like shrines there. Uh, mostly we find oxen bones, skulls, horns, and things of that nature. You could argue that that might represent something else. Maybe they're storing bones for some reason. The bones were used to make tools as well. But in Turkey, especially at Katal Hayuk, we find a very similar uh, underground shrine and very similar use of oxen skulls and horns as sort of religious icons. This, rep this could represent some kind of common cultural exchange over the entire central Turkish northern Iraqi region here in the ancient Stone Age. Tepe Ali Kosh, the second major site that I mentioned, is even more interesting because we find even stronger evidence of agriculture and trade happening. There is, again, large numbers of goat and sheep bones. Now, those are found wild in that region. But there is at least some evidence that these are being herded and bred in this area, not just being caught wild by hunters. We also find, again, strains of wheat and barley, but very particular strains of wheat and barley, which strongly resemble, at least in a very prototypical form, domesticated wheat. And in fact, we can track, because apparently pollen studies a thing, we can actually track the origin of these strains to the Kermanshah region of Iran. You're not too far from that place. 
guys. But in the Stone Age, it's a long trip. Again, even these people migrated from this region before they were in contact with it. And you can also find in the tombs and in house finds obsidian. Again, Armenia is the only local source of that. And cowrie shells, which have to come from the Persian Gulf. So, again, people were traveling the length and breadth of Mesopotamia as far back as 9000 BC, which is a pretty fascinating thing to consider. At the end of the Mesolithic Age, you are standing at the, the cusp of what today most would call the agricultural revolution, the point at which the majority, not all, but the majority of human civilizations began to abandon the traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle that you know, the most early humans would have practiced toward growing their own food and breeding their own animals. The thing is, a question that really historically wasn't asked too much, just kind of taken for granted, was why? What is it that leads people to adopt farming? Now, obviously, with hindsight, we know that you know, agriculture is much more efficient. It produces food in huge quantities. You can't support giant populations on hunting and gathering. But that wouldn't have been something I think most Mesolithic or Neolithic people would have considered. And in fact, the process of agriculture is kind of a mystery to us. Like, how and why was it developed? The how, we don't really know. I would assume it's probably sort of a series of accidental discoveries, people to sort of figure out naturally, oh, seeds grow plants. There's some interesting theories Jared Diamond brings up and Gunn Sherman and Steele, the idea that maybe plants and seeds and whatnot refuse would end up in like the piles of people left behind in their campsites of essentially the waste products. And some of those seeds that might not have been fully digested might have come up the next year and that might have led to one thing after another and people would thought, oh, well, we could plant these. Yeah. But... Excellent point. Yeah. yeah, it's possible, but that in itself is somewhat speculation as well. But here's the more interesting thing to think about it, the whole why agriculture aspect. Near 1966, there were two American botanists, Harlan and Zahari, who were doing work in northern Iraq and eastern Turkey. Now, they were there simply to catalog plants, but they noted that in those regions, there were still to be found Thousands of acres of wild wheat just growing naturally in those areas, as far as the eye could see in some ways. And they began to ask themselves, okay, how, how hard is it to actually gather food from wild grain? How efficient is it to gather these grains naturally? So Harlan took a flip tooth sickle, a pretty standard agricultural and gathering tool of the meal period, and decided to harvest some wild wheat. And he found that within an hour, basically an hour of work time, he could produce about a kilo of grain, not plant, actual grain off the plant. Now, that might not sound like a lot, but, you know, grain isn't very heavy. So a kilogram of grain is a fair amount of grain. They also found that the, the nutritional value and the protein levels of this natural grain were you know, easily competitive with most domestic species. It wasn't that much less nutritious. In fact, in some cases, in some areas, it was more nutritious than certain species. So crunching some numbers, the two figured out that with about three weeks of work, you could harvest enough grain to feed a family of four for an entire year. And so they asked themselves, well, wait a minute, if with a relatively small investment in work, we can gather enough food to feed ourselves for 12 months and not have to plant a thing, you know, grain as far as the eye can see, why in the world did anybody start planting crops, which is a much more labor-intensive process? That's a question we um, some of can't actually answer. We don't really know what the people of the ancient Stone Age were doing or why. We have to guess. However, it makes a little more sense if you consider what's happening in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is very fertile. In fact, it's more, it was more fertile in the ancient days than it is today, thanks to a wetter climate and also as a matter of fact, we'll talk about this a little bit later. But as fertile and as lush as this region would have been in the early period, there's a limit to how much it can support. Now, any of you who are familiar with zoology or even hunting might be familiar with a concept called carrying capacity. Now, if you don't know what that means, carrying capacity is roughly what size of the population of a certain animal can the resources of a certain area support. So basically, again, for modern uh, hunting in the United States especially, States consider the populations of species based on the food supplies, and they set numbers of how many can be taken per year based on the end of population or letting it grow. The theory here, that's called the marginal lands theory, is that early hunter-gatherers were extremely limited on the carrying capacity of the area they lived in. Basically, while there's plenty of food available to go looking for it, there are animals to hunt, fish in the rivers, wild grains, fruits, nuts, all that stuff, 
because nature you know, isn't maximizing its production, it's just random, you know, what grains fall on the ground grow, you know, what seeds don't get fully digested, you know, might sprout. The carrying capacity of the land that you're hunting and gathering is far lower than its theoretical max. Therefore, no matter how good it might seem, the actual population you can support is actually fairly low. Of course, populations of anything have a habit of growing on their own. Basically, the longer people lived here, the more people there were. Population increased slowly but steadily, especially as humans became better and better at you know, murdering everything that might threaten them. It reaches a point, and we think this is sometime in, in the Middle East at least, sometime between 7,000 and maybe 5,800 BCE, the carrying capacity of the land begins to be exceeded. Populations begin to grow larger and faster than natural resources can support. At first, people probably just left. Well, if there's not enough food here, we'll pick up stakes, we'll travel somewhere else. That became harder and harder as permanent and made permanent settlements became more and more common. It's one thing to abandon your cave or you know, leave your tent behind and travel somewhere else. You just spent no generations building a town. That's a hard thing to leave behind. Now, there might be reasons why you stayed there in the first place that you're abandoning. As food supplies became lower, and as populations were forced to live in more and more marginal land, agriculture might not have been so much an innovation as an absolute necessity, that they needed to secure new food resources in the face of potential famine and starvation. Ultimately, these agriculture communities discovered they had far more control over their food supplies. Hopefully that control means stability, it means safety, it means security, even if it has some you know, fairly significant advantages to go along with it, i.e. lots of labor and actually a far less balanced diet. Hunter-gatherers are in general far healthier than early farmers in terms of well, their vitamin, mineral, and protein consumption and skeletal health. is it, It's actually pretty starkly dramatic how different it can be. Also seems to me that once you have climate change kind of kick in this region, the areas that were once the most fertile and the most well producing have the largest amounts of games and wild, you know, produce to take. Once those areas are not as numerous, you actually have a reason to instead of migrate from that region to the next to stay in that one. And if an area has been sort of settled and taken over by sedimentary people, then the hunter gatherers have to look elsewhere. The prospect of selling down somewhere else that has a relatively large supply looks better. And then once more and more of those happen, you essentially set, look at the prospect of trying to become sell yourself or moving to further and further marginalized areas. That's why you do end up with essentially these nomadic peoples in the other place like the Arabian Desert and the Steppe, some of the least productive regions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye to the mid-Neolithic, because you can, a lot of historians date the Neolithic to 10,000 BC, but it varies from region to region. But by 5800 BCE, in the Middle East, in Mesopotamia, you are very firmly in the Neolithic period. You are Farming is almost exclusively practiced along the two rivers, and populations are slowly being to spread south. Remember, the earliest settlements are in the far north, at the foothills of the Taunus Mountains, and up in what we call Assyrian later period. So you have the next phase of history, which is a period of almost 2,000 years, is the slow movement of people south down the Tigris and Euphrates to ultimately settle the entirety of the Mesopotamian River Valleys. The earliest period is called the Hasuna period, basically 1500-5500 BCE. Again, in the Mosul region, the earliest finds were in about 1943. Uh, not a great year to doing archaeology in the Middle East, but ultimately it was being done. Um, Scientists, am I right? <laughs> anyway, by this period, though, you have all the hallmarks of an agricultural society. You have fairly sizable permanent settlements. You have clear examples of domesticated plants and animals. You have, most importantly, ovens. We find in some of these villages large community clay ovens, which are obviously being used to make bread or, well, maybe cook meat as well, but bread is the staple product of early agricultural societies. Interestingly enough, these ovens are of a type that you will still find in some of the most rural parts of Iraq today. So that technology is still going strong. Uh, but you find a lot of tools. Again, these are agricultural tools. Hoes and picks and shovels. Well, shovels are bones mostly. Uh, sickles. Clearly these aren't hunting tools anymore. They are people who are working the land and growing grain. They are a pretty wide variety of plants. Again, wheat and barley are the staple. Barley more than wheat, actually. Barley can tolerate much worse soil than wheat. But you also find uh, lentils, chickpeas, watercress, and a whole variety of other plants being grown. Again, staples of the modern Middle Eastern diet in a lot of ways. 
to trace themselves back to this period. You also see elaborate burials. Now, we find tombs before this. Now we're actually seeing some real funerary practices. Uh, many people are being buried in large clay jars. Uh, jar burials, they're called. They're actually fairly common in the uh, late Stone Age and even the Bronze Age in some regions. You also see people being buried in goods, in grave goods. This is, again, a sign of a more advanced and prosperous material culture, but also a more developed religious culture, because you don't generally bury your dead with artifacts and by certain rituals unless you have some kind of spiritual or religious ideas about death. And also indicates a sort of ability to move beyond the absolute scarcity, because you're essentially saying as a level status, I can afford to give these things to a dead person. I can honor my father by putting these things in the ground rather than using them. But yeah, absolutely. Definitely a sign of that. The jar barrels, would that have been the kind where they put under the floorboards? Uh, in cities? some cases, yes. You find a lot of barrels under the floors of houses. And, uh, not always, but a lot of times that is the case. Pottery is also being made in large amounts, all kind, not very primitive shapes still, but again, removing water, storing grain, cooking food, all of that stuff. Very similar. And the thing is, this is what's interesting about this in the Hasuna period. The pottery you find there, in broad strokes, very similar to standard Middle Eastern clay work that you find in Syria and Iran and Turkey and elsewhere. But the actual specifics of how it was being made and decorated are unique to that region. So we're definitely seeing a unique culture begin to emerge here. Interestingly enough, beyond this, um, kinds of art, you actually see a lot of figurines. Some made of copper. This is the first real ideas we have, sorry, first real samples we have of the early humans working with metal. There's no evidence they're making metal tools. They're still very firmly a Stone Age society, but they know what metal is and they can clearly work it to some degree. We also find what we think are amulets or necklaces that very strongly resemble what are called cylinder seeds. Now that becomes way more significant later, but to jump ahead slightly for explanation purposes, a cylinder seal is basically how you would sign legal documents in the later Uruk period and beyond in Mesopotamian civilization. So, no evidence of writing, but there's clearly something going on here, personalizing items that identify you as an individual. And a cylinder seal, if you uh, need more of a sort of idea what that would be, imagine like a stone piece that you would roll out. It would be literally in a cylinder, and once you rolled out, it would make a rectangle-like shape. Kind of similar concept to the idea of a signet ring. The idea is you'd have an intricate one and a unique one for your position as a king or a high priest or whatever, and no one would be able to copy that. The same way no one would have the exact signet ring that whatever noble would have in the middle of the Exactly. You press it into clay, and then you sign it. Uh, so yeah, we find some items that look a lot like that in the Hasuna region. Again, no evidence they're writing anything down, but again, it's interesting thought. Also, and this is very rare, not a lot of samples survive. Uh, in some huts, probably the more advanced ones, there's plaster interiors, as indications they were actually painting frescoes on some of these plasters. So obviously people of high rank, high status, or at the very least high wealth, were saying, well, I'm going to spend my resources making my mud hut look pretty. And to be fair, that's something we've done for ages. You know, we found the ancient cave paintings oh, yeah. in France and whatnot. Absolutely. The giant structures under Malta. So at the end of the Hasuna period, we transition into what's called the Samara period, which is the period that we mentioned. Uh, it overlaps a little with the Hasuna period, about 5,600 to 5,000 uh, BCE. Now, this is interesting because it's found much further south, in the so-called Middle Tigris region, getting closer to what would now be Babylon. Not quite there, but getting close to that region now. Uh, now, it overlaps a little with the Hasuna area. We think it's actually probably a, a splinter of the Hasuna culture. Uh, very similar in actually a lot of ways. Planting similar crops, building similar style houses, uh, conducting jar burial. Very, much more elaborate, though. They were far more interested in funerary rites and burials in Samara. And you also see the first time cities are being fortified. Now, this is not all cities. Now, more of the largest villages are doing this, but there are clear foundations of mud brick walls being found in some cities. Others have moats, some have both. So it was very clear that there was some kind of competition and perhaps even warfare, or at the very least some kind of hostility between these villages. Though we don't really find a lot of evidence of what that resembled. We don't find a lot of you know, ruins and burns. We don't find a lot of battlefield remains, clear evidence of violent deaths. Or sling stones, that's a pretty common sight in some areas. Yeah. Not so much here, though. Still, it is interesting that clearly competition for, be it resources or land, is sheer stupid pride, is clearly happening at some level. 
Also, the uh, Samara period is unique for making large numbers of clay statues, very small like figurine style statues, uh, mostly of women, sometimes of men. Uh, some of these are the so-called mother goddess statues. They're probably more just generic fertility icons. The thing is, the style they were using, you know, the poses, the proportions, the decorative patterns, is very, very similar to late, to, for later Sumerian art that you'll see you know, in the height of the Uruk period and beyond. So clearly a very old artistic tradition has foundation here in the Middle Stone Age. Then you have the, it's called the Hala period which actually overlaps a great deal with the Samara period, about 5500 to 4500 BCE. The Hala period is actually a weird one in that it overlaps with, again, the Samara period a little bit, and a tiny little bit with the Hazuna period. But it's also found much further north, near the Turkish-Syrian border, not so much the central Mesopotamian. And in fact, we're pretty confident that the Hala people are my these aren't necessarily native Mesopotamians at that term being used in the Stone Age. The reason we think that is, the first sites were uncovered on the 1913, uh, World War I kind of full stop to a lot of work in the region. In fact, it was mostly forgotten until the 30s. But they discovered that, unlike the sort of square or rectangular uh, mudbrick houses that the uh, Hasuna and Samara people were building, the Halaf people preferred to build basically beehive shapes. Uh, Homes. These are called Tholoi by archaeologists, and what makes this particularly interesting is you see Tholoi uh, style villages in Anatolia, outside of Turkey, but the Mycenaean Greeks built them as tombs. Hmm. So there's, is there a connection there? We don't really know. And the Mycenaeans were messing around in Turkey, but were they doing it that early? Well, the Mycenaeans exist in the Stone Age. Well, there is the theory about how the Greek colonies were already there, because they think the Trojan War might have been between a Greek city and Asia Minor. Like, how close is uh, this period to Troy? It's pretty close. Well, well, Troy is a settlement, probably very similar. I mean, quite an overlap there. But we're pretty confident the Trojan War probably happened in the Bronze Age, mm -hmm. not the Stone Age. Fair enough. But still, is there some kind of common architectural culture that stretches between Greece and through into Syria? There's some evidence of it. Definitely interesting. In the Halaf villages, we also find a further connections to a broader appeal. We don't find the cylinder seal amulet. Instead, we find a lot of stranger things. Again, they wore jewelry, mostly amulets around the neck, but these are, some are in the shape of heads of bulls, some are in the shape of axes, some are actually miniature buildings with gabled roof, the sort of modern peak roof, which they did not build style, that, that style of house, or at least not, not very widely. This actually pretty widely resembles some of the uh, sacred art we find among the Minoans in Greece. Again, the double-headed axe, the bull head, very important symbols in prehistoric Greece. Again, it speaks of a common culture in the Mediterranean that is having some influence in Mesopotamia as, as far back as what we currently see. And pottery is found in large amounts in these regions, as it is almost all civilizations, but it's highly ornate. We're talking a lot of very specialized kinds of pottery. We're seeing spouts, we're seeing lips, we're seeing handles, we're seeing some fairly elaborate shapes, which might have indicated pottery wheels are being used. Uh, we haven't found any preserved, but the shape of the pottery, you can make that by hand. It's much more difficult. Uh, also, you see a lot of geometric patterns and colors of red, blacks, whites. Very reminiscent of the styles you see actually in Persian rugs up into the early modern period. Again, a common uh, a remnant, I suppose you might say, of an ancient culture surviving. More than that, though, you can find Halak-style pottery all over the Middle East. Again, in Halak settlements, you find an obsidian, you find cowrie shell, there's been gemstone. It indicates they are trading this pottery for, again, obsidian has used as tools. The rest is purely decorative. They're basically buying luxury goods, is really the modern term, in exchange for pottery. I guess it was popular enough if one to buy it. Best guess, the, the Halaf people are probably some kind of migration of people out of central Turkey who settle all throughout the Aleppo and Jazeera regions in the North Syrian border to northern Iraq. They, we don't know why they left. They might have been forced out by conflict, maybe drought, famine, maybe they were a nomadic group that decided to settle down all of a sudden. We don't really know, unfortunately, but it's definitely fascinating. Around the year 5000 BCE, so all of this merged into a single culture. Basically, it's called the Ubayyad period. 
which is roughly 5,350 BCE. In the first example, we call continuous culture, basically styles of art, styles of architecture, styles of pottery, styles of tool making. Umayyad styles we found literally the length and breadth of Mesopotamia in this period. It seems to either replace, conquer, or subsume every other Neolithic civilization in Mesopotamia. The first sort of universal Mesopotamian culture, discounting fringe regions like the Arabian deserts or Caleb and things of that nature. Interestingly enough, the Umayyad period is the first, as we mentioned, the first period of real urbanization we see in Mesopotamia. Cities are getting larger and larger. They're still small by modern standards, and even small by later Sumerian standards. But they're starting to get bigger and bigger. In addition to this, you're starting to see real evidence of city planning. Streets laid out, not exactly in a grid, but definitely with some thought given to how the city is structured. And you also see, for the first time, an actual public building down in the center. In this case, religious centers, temples, in a modern sense. And these temples... They're pretty basic, but they're fairly elaborate for the span of the time. They're the largest buildings in town often. In many cases, they're built on top of raised clay platforms that tower above the other regions of the settlements. And inside, again, you find some pretty elaborate uh, wall paintings, carvings, and of course, statuary. Mostly made of stone, so of course, the statue of the god is far more important than the little clay figure you put your porch. In addition to this, well, we don't have writing to confirm it, at least not any real serious translatable writing. We see very early examples of what might be proto-cuneiform, we'll get to that in a second. But it's pretty clear from the size, from the decoration, also the presence of granaries, that these temples are cultural, economic, and political centers of villages. Well, this is the point in which the priest class actually runs the cities, isn't it? Yeah, basically. Now, we don't have 100% confirmation of it, but based on what happens later on in the Uruk period and very similar styles, it pretty strongly suspected that yeah, a priestly class had emerged that basically assumed political as well as spiritual power in these societies. Yeah, the word that I believe that was used for the pre like at least the leadership, like the direct leader at this point, was NC, wasn't it? E N S I. N S I, yeah. Um, I think there's a couple of other words used as well. That's the most common one. Yeah, the NC is more or less kind of the proto-king. Like, that is sort of the emergence of a centralized figure, centralized authority with some sort of backing. Like, the uh, Mesopotamian history class I had when I went to SOUE talked about how if you look at the early portions of the Epic of Gilgamesh, you see evidence for what might have been the proto it was the proto leadership of the state. They talk about the city elders, which the professor I had speculated they could have even been fairly egalitarian, split between men and women. You know, by the time you start to see Gilgamesh re record an actual writing, you actually have him as the king of a city and that sort of thing has changed. But there's evidence of this in the prominence of the temple. And this period that is sort of the transitional period where the idea of the eldest and the wisest and the sort of leaders of their groups leading everyone, it transitions into, well, let's have the priests make the decisions. They commune, commune with the divine. They have more knowledge than us. And later in the periods that will be described, uh, we'll transition more into civilian military leadership. Anyway, uh, the Ubed period, again, it's still a, a sort of prehistorical in terms of no real writing to study, but Looking again at its art and its architecture, the statuary, this is basically the, the nucleus of what we call Sumerian culture. Not quite there yet. The first nation, if nations, it's not one nation, the first nation, the Sumerian nations, they really have their start culturally and politically here in the Ubiad period. By 3750, the Ubiad period is overtaken by the Uruk period. We're finally getting into what most will call history at this point. There are written records to study. You're also getting into the Bronze Age. Now, well, the Metal Age, we'll talk about that here. Basically, over the course of 600 years, now, you could argue the Uruk period lasted longer, Muslim Day was shorter. There's talk of transitional periods after it, but basically, the Uruk period is this is where Sumerian civilization begins. This is where the major cities of the south along the Persian Gulf form. They become the real political and economic powers of the entire river valley. Now, the Uruk period straddles what's called the Chalcolithic Age. Now, that's an odd term you don't hear very often because it actually doesn't make a lot of sense. It means copper stone. It refers to the period in which stone was still the primary tool source, but increasingly people were playing around with copper as an alternative. And 
you see more and more copper tools begin to appear until someone figured out how to make bronze, and then suddenly, bronze age. One reason why bronze took so long is there has the misfortune of copper and tin not really being in the same places in most of this region. You get tin from what? The areas of Afghanistan, Turkey? Afghanistan, there's thought that's in Turkey, though that source is long exhausted. There's a little bit in Eastern Europe, Sinai Peninsula, and then of course, Western Europe has large amounts. Yeah, and so you end up with people who have access to tin, don't really have access to copper. You have to kind of wait for these sort of systems of large-scale trade and metallurgy for them to actually trade these two uh, metals with one another and then experiment around. It doesn't help that both tin and copper are what they call the rare earth elements. They're not the most common things you found. That's the ironic thing about when you compare the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. It's not that iron ended up being so much more effective of a material. It's so much more abundant of a material. Oh, yeah. This is the period in which everything kind of comes together. This is when the, big, the standard pattern becomes the city-state. The large fortified dwellings, ruled over by an organized bureaucracy, headed up by the, well, the priests, essentially, of the temple. Each city, as far as we can tell, seemed to have followed a particular deity in the pantheon. There, there's a whole, we'll talk more about this in later episodes, there's a whole pantheon of gods and myths, but each city seemed to hold a particular god as either its protector or its mythological founder, or even its, its theoretically its king. And there was some belief in between cities and the relevance of other cities' gods. For example, the Ubrick City, which the pair is named after, its chief god is Inanna, which later is named Ishtar in Akkadian. And it's a fairly prominent uh, figure. There are sort of evidence of essentially donations being given on a citywide scale, trailing all the way back to Uruk from other cities. The idea is your city would actually donate to temples of Uruk in order to gain the favor of the god that looked over Uruk for your people. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about, the interconnection of these. It speaks of an old, very old, sort of common religious idea that survives the, the balkanization of the region of political blocks. One of the reasons that this takes shape way it does is the Uruk period sees the final phase of a massive climate shift. In the Stone Age, the Middle East looked very different thanks to the influence of the Ice Age and a general cooler and much wetter environment. The region begins to become far drier. Now, this is a process that's been happening since the glaciers receded. But by 3750, you're really hitting the high point. Now, this means the whole region is starting to desiccate to a very great degree. You see, in the Stone Ages, you could have traveled pretty far distance from either Tigris. In fact, the Tigris and Euphrates were much larger rivers. In fact, they're pretty big rivers today. If you go to them today, they're not small rivers. But there's strong evidence they were probably as big and moved as much water east as the Mississippi River is today. They were huge rivers. Numerous tributaries, a lot of marshy regions, a lot of forested regions, a lot of greenery. As a, as a little side theory, there is, a, I, I remember a long time ago I saw the History Channel make the claim that, uh, you know, there's a passage in the Bible about the Garden of Eden laying at the uh, crux of, I believe, five rivers. Mm -hmm. And the idea is there may have been three other major rivers that all ran from marshy areas at the end of the, where the Persian Gulf meets the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates that have now dried in sense. Yeah. So what would, have, what would have caused the end of that? The end of the glaciers? They would have all uh, well, just not, run dry? It's not the end of the glaciers per se, but it's a process that solves Earth basically. Well, technically it becomes cooler, but it becomes... Basically, you see a shift in the way the hydrological cycle is working. Now, basically, much less rainfall starts to fall in the region. The temperature technically goes down, but that means less humidity is coming into the area as well. Opposite, I should note, of what some of the Bible literary scholars believe, which is prior to the flood of Noah, there was no rains. It was uh, simply that the earth was watered via underground streams ah, or yes. whatever. Yes, I've heard that. No, it was rain. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Bible literalists. Checkmate. Anyway, the point is that by the earth period, a lot of that greenery is gone. Uh, many of these tributaries dried up. Uh, marshes would have become you know, flat steps or even just arid plateaus and lots of areas desertified um, and in fact even today you can find spots between the two rivers that are basically desert there's just nothing there over the course of thousands of years people have been moving down these two rivers exploiting the very fertile soil and water and suddenly about half of it is gone now it's a gradual process probably centuries and millennia in the making but if you're unfortunate enough to be living on a in a village on one of those small little tributaries that just is 
gone, it gets smaller every year, you gotta leave, you gotta go somewhere else. More and more population gets concentrated in the few remaining good agricultural regions, which means settlements get bigger and bigger and bigger as a result of this. You see a transition from generations over you know, what was once some of those fertile and red basket areas of the whole region into what could be seen as fairly, uh, you know, easily comparable to sort of modern Africa. There are parts of Africa where the resources are just stretched so thin that you have this sort of state of constant warfare over resources. Like South Sudan is a great example. Like the conflict over there was essentially water and cattle. To look at the fighting that happened in the early 21st century over water and cattle in South Sudan, not so different other than perhaps the armament comparing Kalashnikovs to bronze short swords and battle axes, but not so different in its origin and its aims from what the people of that time would have been fighting over. So definitely, it's going to be an interesting thing to think about, this cycle of resource conflict. The people in Mesopotamia had an advantage, and despite as bad as things might have seemed with all this drying up, the Tigris and Euphrates are still massive rivers that weren't going anywhere. More than that, they also flooded every year, which meant that they were going to water the land and re-fertilize the soil. Those of you who say Egypt at all know all about the Nile floods every year. We watered the land and deposited silt to keep them fertile, and it was a joyous occasion and all that stuff. Uh, the Mesopotamians, yes and no, basically. The Tigris and Euphrates flood usually annually. It's not always predictable, but it usually happens annually. And yes, it deposits silt, which keeps the region reasonably perfect, very fertile in ancient times, as well as lots of, you know, agriculture in the region. But it's a very, um, unpredictable kind of thing. The Nile floods annually because of the way rainfall patterns work down in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's very regular, very predictable, and very gradual. The Tigris and Euphrates flood because of snow melt and rain in the Taurus Mountains, and that is extremely unpredictable. Uh, one year you might get a very gradual and easy flood. The next year might be catastrophic and wipe your city out. The year after that might not happen at all and you have famine. Which gives some, you know, good idea to why Egypt so early on was able to centralize. You know, given this stable, predictable source of food, you're able to kind of build works, feed your people, maintain a society with the sort of uneven back and forth of floods, of devastation, of not enough, of plenty. You know, it's no wonder that one city might lose power when a different city down the river who may have had a better growing season that year is able to seize it from. It's no wonder that the people of a city might overthrow their people and become open to the predations of another city. It's not, you know, it's understandable why the individuals of the Uruk area would eventually branch out and colonize the north and other regions. So what ultimately happens here is that in order to take, the thing is, you can't just rely upon the flood. Now that helps, but that's going to dry up again really quickly once the water proceeds. You have to basically it takes out of human effort to maximize your return and also to minimize the damage of flooding in case of a bad flood. This is what anthropologists and sociologists and historians call hydraulic civilization. I call that because the movement and control of water is basically everything. They dress it up in trappings of you know, all kinds of other elements. That's a part of it too, but the core of it. Mesopotamian civilization is all about keeping those irrigation systems working, keeping those levees intact, and trying to control and utilize that water to the maximum degree possible. Now, unlike Egypt, now Egypt has its too, but again, the gradual pickle flood means it's easy. It's relatively simple. You can get out of the way. You don't need an extensive system of levees. You don't need a complicated system of canals and ditches and wells and retaining ponds to keep and distribute this water. In other words, while it's still very difficult and very backbreaking labor, in the Nile Valley, agriculture is reasonably easy. In Mesopotamia, it requires a very carefully planned and controlled system. That means somebody has to be in charge. There has to be a central authority which can both dictate how it's to be done, can command people to do the labor necessary. That's the thing. There's no, there's no taxes in the modern sense. It's mostly labor tax or grain tax. A lot of it was what we called corvain labor. You went out and you worked in the irrigation system to keep it dying. Which, I'll know, is how they believe the pyramids were largely built, not so much the slaves. But more than that, you also need an authority which can basically decide who gets use of how much water, who gets use of how much land. It all has to be controlled and managed very carefully. So you end up with basically more civilian leadership taking the reins. You see 
you know, these this warrior class who is able to actually dominate the field with troops, with tactics, actually taking that ability back home. There is cases of the NC, the E-N-S-I, the priest king, uh, it coexisted with a military leader called the Lugal, L-U-G-A-L. However, as time goes on, more and more Lugals appear to take full control of the city and became like proper kings, and fewer and fewer NC retain a prominent political role. They certainly have a cultural, religious role, but it's kind of subservient to the guy who calls the shots, who lives inside the palace, who commands the army. We're very confident that the reason, uh, well, actually, tell civilian leadership obviously has to do with the organization. We're fairly confident that the reason that priests and the temple emerged, because think of this from the vantage point of your, your average browser farmer. He doesn't know why there are floods. He doesn't know why one year his house might get swept away and the next year he might starve. He just knows it happened, it's unpredictable, and even his best efforts can barely control it. Basically, without understanding really anything of why these things are happening, he doesn't understand climate change, he doesn't understand flood cycles and rainfall levels, he doesn't understand any of that. All he knows is that his life and death is clearly at the whim of some unknowable power, obviously a divine power in this case. And so the idea that you turned to your priests who spoke to the divine to placate the rivers as it were made sense. You look for, and this is the case in most early civilizations, people looking for answers to questions they weren't equipped to really ask or understand, it turns to the spiritual food explanations for them. I mean, we know, obviously, that it didn't matter how many bushels of grain you sacrificed to the Euphrates of a flood or not, as it felt like. If the, uh, the, the flood was gentle that year, well, there are potential benefits the priest class have for society. Like the, the donations given to the church, it's possible not all of those were just richly burned or thrown away on sacrifice. It's possible that some leftovers were given as long as the poor. Some of the grains may have been stored in church granaries for uh, lean years. Given that the priest class, they may have been believing in literally a group of deities who nobody believes in. There's not a person alive, as far as I'm aware, who would argue with me that these people for sure knew what they were talking about. But they were the most educated people in their societies. They were the people who read. They were the people who had learned from the most educated people of the last generation who passed down these stories. In addition to performing these rituals and doing these incantations to placate gods, is it possible they had some knowledge that had worked in the past for perhaps reasons they had no idea why it had, that they were able to impart to society? I think it's quite possible. Well, indeed, they definitely represent an educated class of society. And... There is a very clearly a civic aspect to what the temple is. They're not, they're not some kind of you know, greedy institution. They do perform real function. Whatever the case may be, though, it's out of this, it's out of both this development of a religious system and structure and class, as well as out of the development of these comprehensive agricultural systems that so much else develops. But for example, as I said, someone has to control, someone has to design the irrigation system, someone has to manage the population to keep functioning distribute water and land, and even food in bad years. That requires records. We see writing. Now, we do prototype writing in earlier periods. Well, the prototype writing is kind of fascinating because the way it was described to me is it was largely a way to keep track of who would sacrifice what, who would give it what, when. And so you'd have this sort of thing where it's described as like a plaque or even like a ceramic or you know clay ball because the way all this writing happens is not on papyrus, it's not on animal skin. It's on clay. They take clay and they form into bricks and they, well, they carve the rind into it and then they bake it. And it gets really hard, almost as hard as stone sometimes. And the idea is some of these early ones you would have had a ball that perhaps would have had some sort of pictograph writing as some of the early Kineo form was. And maybe it was a pictograph of a sheep. Maybe if you looked at it, you wouldn't recognize a sheep. But someone from that society who have seen it many times would be like, oh yeah, it looks just like it. And perhaps because you were a wealthy farmer, you would have had to donate 10 sheep a month or a year or whatever it would have been. And they would have given you this ball, a little plaque with a little sheet picture wrap, and ten little dots smashed into it with a stylus. And it works somewhat. The problem is, does that represent ten you've given? Ten you received? Does it represent, you know, ten that was given this year? Does it represent last year's debt? And so you need something a little bit more complex to sort of represent all the things it meant. But those were the baby steps. It was essentially... The origins of writing things down and keeping tabulation was essentially your receipts you received from the temple. 
precisely. And what happens in the Uruk period is these early pictograms become increasingly stylized, and they develop into an actual alphabet, which is used not so much now for, like, oh, this is a picture of a sheep that means a sheep. This is a symbol for sheep in our language. That's a very complicated form of writing. It's something like 2,000 symbols, some of which we still don't understand. It's a very limited thing in some ways. But looking at thousands of clay plaques found in some of these temples, and some of these sites, Uruk is an especially rich source of them, but other places too, these seem to be basically bureaucratic records. This is census data, this is tax data, this is information on the levies, information on how much grain to pay per laborer per day, how much tax to collect per acre of land, how much salary did the, you know, the acolytes of the temple get this year. It's very much the kind of paperwork that you would see in a modern government. It's later, but uh, another huge set we find is at Ur 3, which we believe isn't necessarily like even a like, glacial site. It's like a it's like a warehouse site. It's a place where they would have stored and distributed things, and it's just records upon records of what they had, who gave it, when it was given, how much was due, how much landage it was due, contracts. That is a extremely complex bureaucracy. Did you even see the origin of it in the Ur period of the the ideas of things like that we have, like such as taxation, uh, property law, the legal system, like all that has origins here. More than that, in the Uruk and beyond, you can, we also find these little clay boxes. They're open on the top, but so are the rails, different sizes. And we realize, based on finding grain in them, these are actually grain measures. They clearly have some kind of system of weights and measures to determine well, how much grain. We don't know what their measures were, but like. Measure, weigh out and measure out grain amounts to determine, again, probably taxation or food rations or what have you. Which standardization weights and measures is a hilariously common problem for our history. There is, of course, the, the famous thing of the foot change, or maybe it was the yard change every time there was a new king because of the uh, distance from the tip of his finger, the tip of his nose, if he held out his hand the entire length. Yeah, or in colonial America, we were surveying land of chain. Was it a 12-foot chain or a 6-foot yeah. chain? How many hands high is my horse? Uh, yeah, how many furlongs per fortnight, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we don't really know. I, I somehow doubt there was any real standardization. I mean, if you assume that each city was different. I'm In sure. fact, we don't actually see any solid evidence of standardization from like the late Akkadian Empire, which is way later. But again, this is where the cylinder seal comes into play, because once you make a contract, you have to indicate that you accept it. And of course, 95% of people are illiterate. You have these personalized stamps you can roll into the clay to leave your mark behind it. Everyone who saw that knew, oh yeah, that's the guy. He's accepted this this, this contract. He can't lose a lot of it now. A foreign merchant is the same kind of thing. You also see early mathematics. Now, we don't know a lot about how it would work. We do know they were doing four function math. Um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. They were using a somewhat convoluted method to do it, but they were doing it. We also find what are called calculi, these little play, they look like little dice, honestly. If you're a D&D player, they basically look like little, you know, six and four and eight and twelve sided dice, and yet we don't know exactly how they were used, but we do know, because there's similar items in other cultures, and even in the Middle East later on, they were clearly used as counting aids to indicate, you know, how much of something you had to keep easy track of these amounts. So some sort of proto-abacus type Essentially, thing. yeah, kind of system like that. In the temples and in the homes beyond, you also see the finalization of any of the art that else we saw in the Iliad at earlier periods. Again, uh, you are seeing you know, complex decorations and fresco wall carvings. You are seeing large statues being made, very high level of quality. There's an alabaster head that was found in order. We're not sure uh, if, if it's a, uh, a goddess or just some local noteworthy individual, but it is made of alabaster, extremely lifelike carving. These were artists who clearly were very well versed in their craft. In fact, when it was first discovered, it was actually kind of amazing because no one really thought that art was that developed that early on. There's also a number of vases we find. A lot of it's pottery, ceramic, and clay, but cheap. We also find stone, probably votive offerings and gifts and ritual items of temples. Again, very finely made, but also clearly very important because they've been repaired. In fact, there's evidence that these items are probably ancient 
maybe even the Earth period, because they've been fixed a few times with glue and metal clips, all kinds of other things. You see, again, wheel thrown, the potter's wheel definitely exists, the plow definitely exists. At some point in this period, the wheel emerges, a huge step forward in all kinds of things with the wheel. Very intricate carvings and decorations, the use of asphalt. They're very small. They didn't, they didn't asphalt the road, but if you had a really important structure, well, you sealed those bricks with tar, yeah. and that would keep it much sturdy, much more waterproof. They also, uh, I guess, because bit bitumen is technically what you're talking about, not tar. It's apparently very rare and very valuable because they used it as inlay in like pottery and statuary and stuff. And some mm -hmm. really rare statues, they actually took the tar and wove it into quills, made the hair pieces for the statues out of it. Yeah, they like to do a lot of those uh, odd fixing gems and whatnot. You see a lot of like those early Mesopotamian statues have these massive eyes, and the idea was they would carve these gems and they put the gems directly in the eyes, mm -hmm. and they would. Uh, likely have clothes and various things and different materials. And yeah, they dress these things up and put the gems in. Look, I'm sure it looked fantastic at the time. One yeah. of the problems with finding they were capable of making what they were making is we're looking at such an early and such a long ago period of time that so little that survives. We have an advantage when it comes to things like masonry and pottery and statues to some degree. Those statues made valuable material fall in the same trap that we had in much of the uh, Egyptian tomb rate. Like We went through a lot of those, well not we, but the Egyptologists and the archaeologists went to a lot of those tombs, and they were looted long, long ago. Tuts was not looted because essentially it had been lost. It had forgotten. I believe it had like a sand dune. Yeah, yeah the hillside collapsed, and they buried it. And they found rel a, basically a relatively minor, relatively unimportant king with just a lavishly full uh, tomb. And similar things have happened in Mesopotamia, where they will find a previously undiscovered cache. It's just full of all kinds of valuables. And the idea is, you know, if if these tomb robbers had been around, which could have been a five individuals, or they could have been kings who not needed to bulk up the treasure a little bit in the reign after that, if they hadn't been looting all these things, like what more might we know uh, of them having? Would we have other examples of these famous, you know, famously uh, well-designed alabaster statues? It's not just robbers. It's also the time. It's also weather. It's also simply just things don't last. There we go. Um, for in the site where it floods every year. For example, when you look at like uh, the Stone Age, there's a lot of speculation about what period, what type of tool may have been designed. Because, for example, when you find axe heads, you only find the heads. There are no hands left because they degrade. So the arrowheads, the spearheads, and so you end up with: Could an earlier wheel have been wheel have been constructed earlier than what we think, out of say wood, and it just rotted? Could there have been pottery styles that we don't know of that were more advanced that got destroyed or lost in time? There's all kinds of things that were were essentially speculative. This far back, history becomes a lot of guesswork, a lot of speculation, a lot of connect the dots, which is fun, but it's unfortunate. It'd be great if we had more, but we also we also have the problem of people intentionally damaging. Like uh, in some of recent history, you know, we had a rude, rude awakening when ISIS looted and sold or destroyed a very large amount of ancient Mesopotamian art. I know, for example, they were devastating some of the Syrian ones, the giant mm -hmm. um, lion man statues. That's not uncommon. The Islamic yeah. Revolution did that. The Chinese Cultural Revolution in China has done that. There's been lots of political movements through either political or social or religious means. They decide that the earlier cultures are decadent or pagan or in whatever case, and their artifacts need to be wiped away. Uh, in some ways, it's a miracle we found what we found. Yeah, very true. The thing about Uruk that's interesting, two elements to it. One, especially in the later Bronze Age period, it seems to be focused more and more in the south, basically along the Persian Gulf Coast, what we would call Sumeria today. And that distinction is important because the division between South Mesopotamia, which is, you know, Sumeria, Akkad, Babylon, Babylon's yeah. kind of on the border, but yeah, Babylon too. In the north, which is mostly Assyria, but there's other groups too. The distinction between them is actually really important. Culturally, they're virtually identical. They're using the same alphabets. They're worshiping the same kinds of gods. Their tracks, their, their architecture and art is virtually identical. There's some regional variation, but it's not a whole lot. But economically, they're worlds apart. The south is rich and populous, and the north is poor. And yet, at the same time, it's the North who will ultimately overwhelm and conquer the South, too. But this struggle between so the Southern Sumerian city-states and the Northern city-states, which are culturally so very similar, 
but the political struggles between the economic and military struggles are going to define really the next two or three thousand years of history in the region in some ways. Well, it's interesting because the Syrians do eventually gain the upper hand, but in this period, it's certainly not them doing it. And it's okay. actually not very much for military matters either. The Rook period, the relationship between the South and North largely seems to be one of either colonization or trading or economic exploitation. There's a little bit of, there's, there's some contention about exactly what it represents, but we certainly find southern sites with like the southern construction and goods in the North being traded, whether these are trade colonies established by southern kings, whether they're private ventures, whether these are actually people who leave the South to go found their own, you know, nations apart from the more domineering centralized control. It's, it's not entirely sure, but whatever the case may be, we see a familiar pattern play out. We see the large centralized state, whether it be Uruk in this period, or you could very easily look to the later Phoenician Greek colonies, the later Roman uh, Empire Republic, and even like the uh, American hegemonic empire in modern day, the area of the largest sort of technological development, the area of the largest sort of sophisticated structures in order to prop up their own military and economic and realistic means, they're able to exert it. They're able to send their representatives outward and extract wealth and bring it back and increase their own power. And this era, that is what Uruk is doing. Uruk is sort of a superpower, the hyperpower of the fourth millennium BCE. And it's interesting how far their reach actually was, because looking at the cuneiform, looking at basically the evidence of merchant contracts and cylinder seals and of that nature, it's fascinating how far they actually went, because obviously they're trading locally, they're trading with the seas of the north, like Asher, but they're going into Syria, they're going into Lebanon, they're going into Egypt, they're going into the Indus Valley, they're going into Oman. All these are mentioned, and we find solid evidence of it. There are Sumerian cylinder seal impressions in clay tablets in Pakistan and India, there are the cylinder seal itself actually becomes an item of fashion worn by Egyptian wealthy Egyptians. They fashion them and wear them as art, basically. They don't use them; they ride papyrus. They found them in the tombs. They have it among the other treasures. It was a nifty little foreign thing. You're like, oh, look at this. I have this. I'm such high status. And yeah, they're trading. And the thing is, they have this reach that crosses the entire Middle East into North Africa and even beyond, perhaps. Beyond. Even if we just consider the most powerful region, the Rook culture period and the Sumerians after it, they're living in a region about the size of Belgium. Their actual size is so small, but their influence is so massive. And again, it's that technological, cultural superiority, I suspect, in some ways. And that's the funny thing, is not even they're small. They're a society that doesn't yet have a centralized military. You don't have a professional soldier class the way you would imagine it. You don't have the ability to go out and conquer another city like the Assyrians could, like the Akkadians would do just in the next era. You you don't have a civilization which has massive amounts of natural resources. They don't have just absolutely brimming gold and jewel mines. They don't have, you know, the ability to wield iron like the later Hittites. You would seem to have a people who just because they were able to figure out things earlier, they were able to urbanize, settle, develop agriculture, go through the whole cycles of priest kings and whatnot, and just have a more powerful, centralized, focused state, are able to more or less dominate everyone around them who, at best, you know, is, is in the last is in the last step of the boat. You know, they they are in the what late copper age compared to the yeah, early bronze yeah, age. What you're looking at. And when you're looking at the level of tools and sophistication, it barely looks different. To our modern eyes, you're looking at two people who are, you know, a handful of steps away from hunter gatherers, and yet the difference is magnificent in these two groups. Yeah, you mentioned it's almost ludicrous how resource poor Mesopotamia is some of Mesopotamia actually is. They've got lots of land and water, although there's only enough um, there's actually interesting a little uh, side note there. The irrigation, which is so vital to survival, is actually killing them. Hmm. You see, they didn't understand irrigation the way again modern scientists would. They didn't realize moving this water out and putting it out in these fields to dry was depositing mighty amounts of salt. Oh. And so, year after year, century after century, the salt is building up, the land being less and less fertile. In fact, this is more, by late Babylonian period, it's a crisis, in fact, this land salvation. And you're also looking at people who don't understand crop rotation. Oh, and, yeah. they, and they have relatively low amounts of diversity. There are the different plants like the lentils, the chickpeas, the barley, and the wheat, but you don't have any of those new world crops. 
crops. No. Um, you don't even have crops from far west Asia, and you don't have the crops that are eventually come down the Silk Road, or, or I meant from far um, west uh, Europe, and you don't have the crops that eventually come down the Silk Road. So you have a relatively stable, relatively common rotation that, yeah, in addition to the increased salt deposits, you're looking at a region that only is getting less uh, fertile over time given climate change. You're looking at an area that's being devastated by its own population, too. Even beyond that, well, you can say that for the time being, they only have water, they have food. Trees they only have. Very little stone. That's another thing. Virtually no metal. Yeah. That's another thing that changes when you work from the south. The north actually does begin to have deposits of stone. Some of their areas they do have access to Lebanon for so, Interestingly enough, in later periods, when the north begins to, begins to dominate, they do have those resources. And so... You have this interesting period where the South is dominant without it, but later when the North catches up, they can't quite compete militarily. Yeah, that's the thing, because we begin looking at these these trade records, they're importing cedar, they're importing copper from Oman, they're importing all this stuff. And yeah, it's kind of amazing to think about a civilization that's so utterly dependent upon resource importing that still becomes so dominant. There should be also parallels to Imperial Japan in that regard, but that's a very different process. Yeah. No that's, a mil- that's a military process, not a cultural one there. Poor this region actually is an absolute term how powerful it becomes to despite that. It's to make a long story a little shorter. Basically, by the time you hit the Bronze Age of the Uruk period, you've got the situation where the center of civilization in the Middle East is this little patch of southern Iraq. It is dominated by basically a relatively small collection of city-states that through luck or you know, luck or anything else have come to dominate these really good agricultural positions and are ruled over by a fairly comprehensive bureaucracy, which is all really centered on controlling water and trying to keep irrigation systems functional. And even though they're making some massively interesting developments in arts, in architecture, in mathematics, in language, even in early literature, potentially, it's still kind of a civilization on the cusp. There's not this strong sense of nationhood yet. Give it a couple of centuries, and we're going to start seeing the first real centralized powers emerge out of this mess. When looking at how Rook actually became so large, I want to consider exactly how it did happen. Uh, essentially, you know, we said the recombination of luck and chance. To return to an earlier topic I'd mentioned, an earlier author, Jared Diamond's Gun, Germ, and Steel actually talked about some of what could have happened with the early developments of agriculture and humanity and civilization, the spread of technology and all that sort of thing. And the Middle East is at a fairly crucial area. It's at an area that benefits from a lot of things, even if it's not what you traditionally think of. Like it suffers from the desertification and the salinization of the soil later. It is actually at this crux of essentially violence. It is at an area where crops and technology and people and whatnot can go back and forth and trade fairly easily. You have the rivers that run down it, you have the Persian Gulf that leads out the Indian Ocean and other large civilizations there. You have the Mediterranean Sea, which leads to the larger civilizations there. And while in this period, the trade isn't as crucial, in later periods, it becomes so. These civilizations which are able to grow each other's crops. You have the ability for people in Mesopotamia to eat the same food that people in Spain, the same people in India are eating. Compare this to, say, Africa, where most of the continent goes north to south rather than east to west. Or in the Americas, where you do have somewhat similar biomes, for example, in Mexico and then in the Andes Mountains, they could grow pretty similar crops to one another. But unfortunately, you've got some pretty substantial geological barriers along, or geographical barriers along the way that more or less prevent you from ever taking those crops and trying to plant them there. There's no reason to try because you don't have any reason to think it's possible given that you can't in between. And so while you have all these different areas that are stratified and they are geographically isolated, Rook does have the ability to snap up all these developments from little neighboring areas and over time absorb more and more of these ideas. As a result of it being at this crossroads, it's able to develop these early areas. It might very well be the reason why early centralized kingship, why early centralized religion, why all these sorts of things, the earliest empires, emerged there. Because if it was going to happen in any place, perhaps it would happen in the area where the most people and the most ideas could come up. The most factors would add up to be the earliest adoption. The Middle East also benefits from the fact that it was settled so early on. It has, as we talked about, a relatively large, relatively speaking, 
percentage of Neanderthal DNA in the people's genetics there. It was a place where early hominids and early humans did go. And being there so long, there was a long exposure between them and the flora and the fauna, which in time led to domestication, which also, according to Gern, Germs, and Steel, is one of the primary factors in the ability to develop large, complex societies and harvest more and more crops. In the Uruk period, what, what we see cultivated at that point, do we have bovine or is it just the... Yeah, you see some species. You see oxen being used as the primary plow animal, for example. Uh, most animals being domesticated with food sources, pigs are the big ones. You see sheep and goats as well. Yeah, that's the thing. The sheep, the goats, the um, pigs, they're all good food sources. The cow is the big difference, though. Because once you have the ability to take an ox and put down a plow, you have the ability to make so much more food so much more quickly. And what that means practically is fewer people inside your society have to be farmers in order to feed everyone else. The fewer farmers you have, the more specialization you can have in your economy. The more people can smell metal, the more people can be priests, the more people can be sold. With a increasingly diverse economy, it leads to increasing larger states and increasing bureaucracy. The fact that Uruk, while it had such so few resources, the fact it could look to its neighbors and have some states who were starting to develop ideas and spread these ideas further, and they could pick up cues from India and Iran, and they could see what the pharaohs of Egypt did. Over time, in a large scale, obviously not an individual king would travel from one area to the other in his lifetime, but over time, the, the ability for the ideas of Things as simple as domestication of animals, agriculture, and whatever various animals they picked up. Well, you might have goats and oxen here. It doesn't mean you have camels. And, uh, Egypt may have camels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. With with those factors, it's it's not that surprising when you consider that most of the other technologies that people layer in access to, the ability to smelt iron, the ability to develop complex feudal organizations. The fact that they're not there, it kind of boils down to who is able to utilize the most low-level tech, and that kind of falls to Uruk in this period. This has been the first episode of the History Hour with Mr. Kent and Professor White. If you like this episode, please share it with your friends, anyone else who would enjoy history. We are the History Hour on YouTube, SoundCloud. You can also follow us on Twitter. If you just love the show and would like to donate, feel free to find us on the History Hour on Patreon.com. We'll have links in the bomb description or wherever we can post it on. So, let's do a little something called post credits lightning round. This is just going to be a section where I throw in a bit of extra, or we might both throw in a bit of extra, of just weird little facts that didn't really fit anywhere else that are fascinating about the time period that people are talking about. So, for one, we uh, we talked about those ovens and how they were used, and they were pretty crucial in uh, early Mesopotamia. But we also talked about how lower Mesopotamia didn't actually have wood, and they traded for wood, the cedar forest of Lebanon. The kings had access to it, but the average commoner, the average farmer, peasant, cobbler, etc., didn't actually have wood that they could just burn away as fuel. So what did they burn those ovens, you may ask? Cow poop, or animal poop, or human poop, but they burned poop. Basically, when you wanted supper, you had to set someone's poop on fire. That uh, that was a that was a part of life in Mesopotamia. And when you're thinking, oh well, that sounds pretty awful. They must have had something else to you know get past that and enjoy themselves. They did. It was called beer. They had tons and tons of it, and it was made of onions. Not all of it, but a significant portion of their onion wasn't. Or a significant portion of their beer was in fact onion. You know, when you think about Uruk and the superpower of the fourth century uh, millennia BCE, think about how. A staple of their culture was cooking their food via animal poop and drinking onion. It's actually worse than that if you think if you think about it, because it's not even if you think onion beer must taste awful, which yeah, but this wasn't modern filtered beer. There would still be like gunk and like plant matter still in the liquid when you poured it. It would be pretty nasty stuff. Oh man, when I think uh, of a sweet, refreshing glass of onion flavored liquid, what I really want that is some. Um, Really nasty, disintegrating yeast flavor. That's just Although, the best. interesting fact, uh, this is much later, but one, at least one civilization was determined to solve that problem, and so they developed cups with inbuilt straws. Oh, there so you go. Suck the liquid off the bottom and not get the gunk on top. Which civilization was that? I think it was the Hittites, or maybe it was the Greeks. I'd have to check. Well, that's kind of weird, because when I've brewed meat in the past, you get the sedimentary falling to the bottom, too. Yeah, you get some of that with yeast, but the actual, like, uh, uh, barley, grain, or onion leavings, they'll float to the top. Fair enough. 
So that seems like a fairly intuitive thing, like scoop the shit out of the beer you're drinking. But, I mean, who am I to judge? I didn't rule the fourth millennia BCE. <laughs> One other quick fact. We mentioned barley and how that was a stable crop because of how the condition of the terrain and the soil wasn't the best. Also, they probably didn't know this, but also tolerate salt fairly well. So that was important. Another notable civilization with kind of marginal soil in some areas who love barley and probably a decent amount of salt given how close they were to the sea, the Vikings. The primary staple of their bread was actually barley. Yeah, marginal soil probably is exactly why. Yep. 